Hey guys, this is Bella here. We are back for some more conspiracy theories. Today, we're going to be reading interesting X-Men movie, movie fan theories that actually make a lot of sense. Um, I don't know if I've read these before, or if I've read some of them like this before, so I apologize. I'm just reading what it says, but um, yeah, let's we'll get right into it. <clears throat> The X-Men universe has become a big and bold uh, has become big and bold in the last 20 years with a wide array of characters, plots and multiple timelines. And there are certain uh, and they certainly have a fan base to match. One of the fandom's favorite things to do is come up with fan theories. And when it comes to X-Men, there are definitely a lot of them. We have managed to write up some of the most interesting fan theories surrounding our favorite mutants. So number 1, Quicksilver li uh, lives with in his mother's basement because of his powers. I apologize if I can't read correctly, I just took a nap and I woke up, so reading might not be the best thing right now, so bear with me. <laughs> Why Quicksilver, despite having amazing powers, live in his, lives in his mother's basement? In the days of future past, we meet Quicksilver and he lives in his mom's basement playing tennis and pong. In Apocalypse 10 years later, after uh, days of future past, we see him again and he's still living there. Watching TV and playing Miss Pac-Man. Now it makes me wonder why someone could basically do anything with his life, spend all this time doing nothing. My theory is, is that Quicksilver can't get a job or go to school because of how mind-numbingly, excruciating, boring it would be to him. Just look at the media he consumes. He, he rigged a tape recorder to play music at a thousand times the normal speed of the song. He made Pong move so fast the audience could even process him playing it. This is the only way he can be entertained. Quicksilver knew, doing a 9-to-5 shift anywhere would basically let... Be like him sitting in a chair for a week straight. Listening to a teacher a lecture would be even worse. The only reason anyone's convinced of him leaving this house to begin with was the thrill of breaking into the Pentagon and meeting his father. And presumably it is too mortal to rob a bank or something. And that's why you have a basement dwelling speedster. Number two, Wolverine smokes cigars to deal with his mutation. Part of Wolverine's mutation is extremely heightened senses of smell. Though can smoke cigars known for their putrid odor to help him cut down from being overwhelmed by the uh, by the thousands of smells he interacts with every day. Um, that his mutant power is cranked up to 11. Imagine being stuck in a new car after stepping in dog poop driving through a paper mall, paper mill that is freshly painted all day. I forget that. Everything about Wolverine is, is heightened. So I couldn't imagine, like, the smells. Because there's just, like, a lot, a lot of smells that could just, like, drive you insane. <laughs> Number three. Wolverine wears bright and yellow spandex so the foes will attack him and not the kids. Wolverine wears a dumb bright yellow costume that completely does not fit his personality so that the Centennials will attack him and not the teenage X-Men who shouldn't really be around. I was reading this interview with the Wolverine director, James Van Golden Y, after using Wolverine's yellow superhero costume for the comics they have not put in, in any of the movies. Specifically, he says, nothing seems less Wolverine-like than the, the desire to put on a trade-marketed outfit, particularly canary yellow, and kind of prance around doing good deeds and have people go. Oh my god, it's Wolverine, at least as I see him. That's the real struggle for me, and it always has been. I think that it's true that it carries over to the comics. The stoic, grumpy, serious Wolverine doesn't really have a personality to match with his flamboyant, bright and yellow costume. So why does he wear it? Consider that he always seems to wear the yellow costume, costume when working with the X-Men. When he's, when he's on his own, when he's working on his own, he usually wears his clothes every day. Practically half the X-Men are teenagers, depending on which version of the team. There's usually at least one underage, uh, underage on the team. The particularly reactive nature of X-Men as a superhero team up of oppressed uh, minorities making makes putting insanely powerful teenagers in harmful situations look somewhat necessary. Wolverine is ridiculously tough and for the intensive purposes impervious to harm. So Wolverine is extremely protective uh, of the young X-Men. Yeah, there's a photo from the animated series. I haven't seen the cartoons or read much of the comics, so... Number four. Deadpool was always a mutant. Before becoming Deadpool, Wade Wilson was a mutant with the power of super dexterity, and he underwent a second mutation to become Deadpool. Watching the Deadpool movie again, it occurred to me that while the Healy Factor allowed Deadpool to exceed the combat abilities of a normal human, it doesn't fully explain the capabilities of his own. No amount of regeneration would, en would enable Wade to accomplish feats like lining up a side of... Uh, 
flip and triple headshot, jumping off a three level overpass to land perfectly in a sunroof of a moving vehicle, throw a sword into a wheel of a motor moving motorcycle while jumping, throw a sword and punch the oxygen chamber without hurting Vanessa, shoot a grenade at a man's hand, or rack up a perfect score on skee ball. Heather says that the treatment would activate any dominant mutant uh, genes lurking in his DNA, but I don't think he had any. He had several, but an active mutation, and that's why the usual methods of mutating subjects didn't work on him until they went to the final Hail Mary prayer oxygen chamber, which combined with the serum, which I imagine acts as a destabilizer in your DNA, introduced a secondary mutation. There's, um, I guess, full theories to this that explains more about it. I will put the link in the description if you want to read the full theories on it. So, it's on Ranker, so, yeah. Number five, the relative strength of a mutant is dependent on the mutant's control over, over their power, not the power itself. It's not the size that counts, it's how you use it. The real secret of some mutants are stronger than others. Professor X can read your mind, telepath, uh, telepathically communicating, and evenly, forcefully halt your movement. Magneto can control all types of metal and can even manipulate ma magnetic fields to levitate and create force fields. But they always didn't have these powers. In fact, if the hands of other individuals, these powers wouldn't be as overwhelmingly powerful as they seem to be with Charles and Eric. We would consider a mutant power to be a like to be akin to a muscle. With use, it can continue to grow stronger and flourish, if, and if left alone, it would uh, atrophy and weaken. It is no coincidence that the two strongest mutants known to man are also the two oldest. Professor X and Magneto have spent decades using their powers, learning to control them and at their full potential. Professor X and Magneto... Oops, sorry. Magneto specifically is a great example for this. Why would it be the... Why should the ability to control metal also be shoehorned into the power of levitation and force fields? Because Eric realized on some level he could control his power and make it that way. As a child of learning at the beginning of X-Men First Class, Eric struggled to move a single coin without extreme stress. By the end, he's turning massive satellite dishes and levitating nuclear submarines out of the water. But it is not the ability to move the massive structures to make his power compelling. After being imprisoned in X2, a much older Magneto uses an iron in a prison guard's cell to, uh, in a prison guard's blood to create his own escape. A younger, less focused Magneto wouldn't have even considered this because a lesser... Because of a laser-tight control he has over his power, he would be able to separate even the tiniest of molecules of metal to use for his own purposes. Number 6. Wolverine killed the X-Men as an act of mercy. It is heavily implied in Logan that Xavier killed the X-Men due to his old mind and age. However, mind that we don't really get a clear answer as to why Xavier results, resents Wolverine so much, like uh, with quotes like Logan, what did you do? And what a disappointment you are. My theory is that Xavier and Xavier's attack nearly killed the X-Men, but the damage was done and couldn't be reversed. Wolverine killed each of the X-Men to end their suffering. Xavier, being the pacifist he has throughout the series, was strongly against this, and ever since, Xavier has some resentment towards Wolverine. It makes sense, because they never really truly explained, like, oh, how the means became, like, um, what's the word? Eradicated, like, they never explain, like, how they die, like, it's, it's obvious that some of them have died in past movies, like, um, like, Alex Summers, um, with that explosion, and, um, in, what was it? Um, and then it was Scott Summers in Days of Futures Past, and then it was... Um, probably others, I just, I can't think right now because I'm tired, <laughs> but yeah, it would, it would make sense. Number seven, the X-Men's continuity and constantly changing because of Kitty and Deadpool. The universe needs a certain events to happen or have the same effect in history in order to stay at peace. Here's why the X-Men continually is constantly changing. The timeline and muddled features and features characters looking different and being younger and older in places when they shouldn't be. Sometimes they'll be undone and brought back to past alive, which is like why Jean is alive in Days of Future Past, yes, she, yet she dies in Dark Phoenix. My theory is in Days of Future Past that it's confirmed that Kitty has been sending people back in time uh, back into the past multiple times to avoid death and such. Not only that, Deadpool has been using Cable's watch as shown at the end of Deadpool 2. 
What if, because of all this time travel, all these different points of times and different areas, the timeline was always changing and therefore couldn't stay consistent? Think of it as a butterfly effect where one small change in, hist in human history made a massive effect for the future. That also would make sense, which is why I, I always found it so interesting that there's different timelines because of Days of Future's Past, because there's, there they have, there's, you know, the different actors, like how you have X-Men First Class through Days of Future's Past, and then you have those characters as older, but then you've got, you know, Apocalypse throughout Dark Phoenix, they're younger? You would think that it would be reversed where it's, you know, and I don't know. I think it, I would stand by the theory of like, it had, it all had to have just been laid down by Days of Future's Past because that's the only way how it was, anything could have changed. So, I don't know. Number eight, Xavier subconsciously pacified the people around him. If I recall correctly, the X Men team, the X Men used to be a nicer team. Cyclops was a Boy Scout. Beast was a, was welcome on the Avengers. Even Wolverine had an honorable rogue samurai and less crazy crazed berserker. Crossovers were generally friendly affairs, often involving Canada. The X Men uh, still had some infighting, but it was scheduled, civilized, somewhat controlled, sparing in the danger room. Honestly, it seems that mutants weren't feared and hated as much as bad as Magneto was the main villain. Then, over time, frustrations with Xavier's mission led to them drifting away, uh, and the x four slash factor slash men taking on a darker, edgier missions. The Chen continued in split space crazed Cyclops killed Xavier, and an apartment tide of assholes flooded the uh, Marvel Universe. Now Xavier was a powerful psychic who tried to avoid controlling people's behaviors, but he wasn't very good at it. Secretly mental... Secret mental logs on Jean's powers, erasing people's memories when it's convenient. I think at a subtle level, Charles Xavier was constantly pushing these people around him to behave in a more rational, civilized manner. Mutants often have trouble controlling their powers, and one first prominent mutant leaders would have more trouble uh, on account than of or of being self-taught. It would be extremely easy for any stray thought of Xavier's about people to be accidentally turned into a nudge into that direction. Basically, Curse has said they traffic get out of my way, people. Then get out of my way. Uh, they got out of my way. Nice. I mean, it wouldn't make sense. I mean, I don't know. Number nine. Logan's memory, ro memory loss isn't from the adamantium. In X-Men, Lo Xavier and Logan start discussing the possibility of Xavier unlocking Logan's past. Where the human side of Logan for some... Where was the human side of Logan for so many years before? How can a mutant that always heals from every wound never remember who they are or where they came from? And how can Xavier unlock it? It's simple. He killed it. Himself. My theory is that Logan was unable to cope with the guilt and reality of the monstrous things he had done or subjected to and has tried to kill himself multiple times during this long life. He heals... I believe even his brain heals. It makes no sense that his brain being damaged wouldn't heal because he lived, he literally survived nuclear blasts that concussively blows that would put others in a vegetable state. However, even the brain tissues heal. Memories don't come back with it. Logan had lived through many generations of wars, being a tool of the hatred, and others even, uh, when he didn't believe in it, uh, in the cause or desire or to partake. Why, when he couldn't handle it anymore, he attempted disastrous efforts to try and take his own life, hoping like he would escape the tragedy and pain, always envious of others who could feel free from their pain. The reason Xavier couldn't see those memories had nothing to do with the animantium or Logan's rage, it was because only pieces and fragments of it were left in his brain, and Xavier could only see what fragments were left. Wow. That would make a lot of sense, because I don't know how a metal could just make you lose shit but <coughs> it is true that logan has been through shit and he's probably i would say he's probably the most depressing most depressing x-men but tries to hide it through badass interior exterior-esque type you know like the amount of shit he's been through i and lick him live to be fucking 300 years old i wouldn't want to fucking live through that shit either so 
Number 10, Jean is constantly sending out telepathic signals to make people like her. Jean Grey is subconsciously, later on possibly consciously, te sending telepathic signals to make most people around her like her and love her. Why, some, why do so many male characters fall in love or become infatuated with Jean Grey for seemingly no reason? I have a thought about this reason. Jean is listed as an Omega level mutant that being classified reserved as for the most powerful and potentially dangerous of the mutants. She is, extremely she is an extremely powerful telepath, potentially more so than Xavier. That said, she also has problems fully controlling that power. This has been a reference throughout various arcs, but what we've seen most previous, uh, most recently when a past version of the original five X-Men are brought to the present day and, t and Teen Jean is shown accidentally reading people's thoughts being able to stop without outside help. She became an X-Men as a teenager and most like, most like, and most teenagers she likely wanted to fit in and wanted people to like her and being especially self-conscious considering that she was the only girl at the time perhaps she even rationalized and subconscious that her teenage brain that her parents sending her to xavier's school was not them wanting to uh, was them not wanting her anymore. They rejected her, so combining these factors, my thought is that Jean subconsciously sends telepathic signals to people around her that encourage them to like her or even love her. When it comes to people uh, she herself is attracted to, like Cyclops or Wolverine, even Charles himself, who I'm sure she mainly sees as a father figure, has been hinted that he is slash was in love with her, but telepathically represses that thinking and emotion within himself. Makes sense. Okay. I'm trying to see how much there is. There's a lot here, I guess. Number 11. Mystique's default appearance. Default appearance is not what we think. Mystique's default appearance is not Raven with blonde hair. In Last Stand, after Mystique loses her powers to the cure, Taser Dark, she turns into a white lady with dark brown hair, but Jennifer Lawrence's Mystique is blonde throughout the first class. My theory is that Raven is a brunette by default, but simply preferred blonde because it's considered more beautiful since she grew up in the war in the 50s after all. And Eric points out in later uh, in first class that young Mystique will always be using 50% of her mind to normalize her appearance, but that does not indicate that normal appearance is her own. She either puts it on by choice or simply gone so long with it that uh, with it that she's forgotten what she actually looks like. I don't think it's the latter it's still uh I don't think it's the latter. She's still mystique no matter how hammered she tend to get. When she of the ability to keep up with her parents or hair out automatically turns black and short, since the X G manifests at puberty, it's possible she had short black hair in her previous essence and she probably doesn't know probably doesn't have the gene to grow out or carry program cell uh program cell death so she doesn't die she just uh replicates cells on injury okay number 12 majority of mutants <laughs> the majority of mutants are attractive because the x gene is vying for domination <laughs> mutant biology expects a uh, strong intermale co competition for mating, right? This is why it tends to be exaggerated on the uh, anatomical differences between sexes. It expects poly pol polygamy. And this is why, because every X gene on Earth wants to be the only X gene on Earth. Every X gene wants to spread as far and, and as fast as possible, but human culture and monogamy has drastically slowed down their speed spread. The X gene expects mutant men to fight each other for mating rights, but instead, like... But instead, mutants, men and women alike, band together and try to fight against humans uh, slash aliens or etc. The X gene was meant to kick off an evolutionary arms race during prehistory, but instead started only uh, activating in large numbers during the modern age, when time and culture had tempted, tempered most of humanity's most violent impulses, and more importantly, the technology had neutralized many of the advantages many mutants would have, would have had. Okay, so there seems to be a couple more. Okay, so number 13. The X-Men mutation also created a staggering infant mortality rate, which explains the hatred of mutants. The X-Men, the first X-Men movie, Charles Xavier talks about how every once in a while, evolution takes a big leap forward, thus the reason mutants exist. There's a big problem with this. 
Evolution is random. Bad mutations happen just as often as good ones, if not more often. This means that there are extreme odds of mutations that are happening uh, to, to a relatively small number of people, and there are a ton of extremely horrific mutations happening to even to even more people. For example, Iceman controls, well, ice. For every Iceman that is born, how many children are born with a grotesque, lethal mutations? Missing limbs, dysfunctional organs, etc. It would take a lot of luck for any X-Men worthy mutant to be born. Considering how major these random mutations are, st statistically, the vast majority sorry, something popped up vast majority of children who get the genes will be dying violently. It is like throwing a puzzle piece on the ground. Eventually, the randomness will form a coherent image, but most of the time, the, piece will puzzle the pieces will be a jumbled mess. This is extreme. Uh, there is an extreme high infant mortality rate in the X-Men universe. The widespread tragedy has led people to have an irrational fear and hatred of mutants as they are associated uh, associate the few survivors with the miseries that they felt. Believable. And number 14. Professor X is a villain and is planning to turn all humans into mutants. I notice a bunch of characters I'm familiar with behaving differently and how I remember them. Almost... Uh, Almost been, uh, villainous, and Professor Charles Xavier is behind all of it. Before that, the X-Men and the most mu uh, mutants treat humans as far less superior beings and now treating humans as they were treated in the past. The X-Men are now immortal, and when they die, they get their con conscious and DNA transported into a rebirthing egg chamber, which means humans can become mutants. Now, in order to rebirth someone as a mutant, you need their DNA. If I remember correctly, at one point, it reveals that Mr. Sinister, who is a member of the of the council, has the DNA of everybody in the world. Now you need their conscience. This is why I think Charles Xavier is behind all of it. Um, I would say most of these are pretty believable. Okay. I would say most of this is pretty believable, but, um, I don't know, let me know what you think. Um, I will leave the... Um, link in the description. If you want to go read some more shit behind uh, these theories yourself. And, uh, yeah. I love you guys. And I'll see you soon. Goodbye.